All right, let's uh, continue where we left off, which uh, was uh, starting to discuss the roughing mill. And uh, this is an image of the uh, roughing mill um, entry. So you've got these uh, red uh, elements here. They are uh, centering guides so that you can place the, um, the slab correctly in the middle of, nicely in the middle of the, uh, the mill, right? The first thing you enter um, in the uh, part of the uh, roughing mill where you enter is the, um, it's an edger. Hmm? And an edger, oops. Uh, an edger is, uh, primary role is adjust the width slightly. Hmm? Um, so you cannot do very large uh, width reductions. We'll, we'll, we'll talk in a uh, moment why you cannot do uh, uh, increases in width, but you can do uh, reductions as width. The, the amount of reduction that you do in width is limited by what the phenomenon that we call uh, dog bone effect. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, if you have something that's rather uh, thick, yes, and you're trying to uh, reduce the, uh, the width of it by having uh, vertical rows, um, you don't get a homogeneous uh, width change like this. The material will not do this as you, uh, as you press it, uh, but, but it will do something like this. And it's, it's, it, I exaggerate a lot here, but uh, and this shape is called dock boning. And of course, when you start rolling uh, the edges, you will uh, s change the shape of your your strip, and that's not something you want to do. So you, it's you can do a limited amount of reduction of width, hmm? Hmm? and and the reason is uh, because if you uh, if you do a lot of uh, width reduction with the f uh, a vertical edger, you will get so-called tongs or fishtails, and we'll discuss that in a moment. Hmm? Uh, but one of the things you can definitely do is adjust the width tolerances. Hmm? And it's always ahead of the uh, roughing mill stands. Um, after the uh, vertical edger, you don't really change the, the width of your uh, product anymore. Hmm? Okay, so here, so, so here you see this this blue stand here. You can see that uh, you have uh, motors on top here. Yes, these two electrical motors, hmm? uh, and um, you have rolls which are vertical. Hmm? So you you if, if, if this this is the slab here, of course it's it's very. Uh, brightly colored, but this is the side of the slab. It looks like this. Right here, you have a roll that uh, that will uh, compress the uh, the slab. Hmm? Um, right. Okay. So this is what the edger does. Hmm? So the edger has uh, vertical rolls, and then the actual roughing mill is a changes the thickness, so it has horizontal rolls. Hmm? So what uh, uh, so it's w when you, uh, what you do with the edger is control the width, and there is a slight increase in width again when you pass through this the horizontal mill. Uh, now, uh, this, this is very exaggerated, okay, on my picture, very exaggerated. Mm -hmm. These amounts of uh, width change is, is very limited, but it's there, and... Um, we can uh, get uh, some data on this in, in a moment. Hmm? So 
the, the width control, right, has an impact on the, the head and the tail shape of your bar. Hmm? So y what you like to have is you enter a, um, a, uh, your mill, your roughing mill, with a perfectly rectangular uh, slab. And uh, so depending on the situation, yeah, uh, the, the amount of deformation that you give in the roughing mill, hmm, you will, width change and, and thickness change, you will get uh, either a nice square shape yeah, or a tongue or a fishtail uh, shape. Yeah? And um, uh, at the bar, in, uh, at the, in the bar, yes? And in addition, um, you may have, and, and the reason why that is, is because you have this, this dog bone uh, effect. Hmm? Okay. All right. So the, um, uh, the, the, the reason, or, or let's say the, the way you can control it hmm, uh, and avoid, or try to avoid, this uh, 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 shape change of the bar, the head or the end of the bar, hmm? and, and if you want to avoid this so-called tongue or fish sh uh, tail shaped uh, bar ends, uh, you uh, have to control the change in width and the change in the thickness. Hmm? And in general, a um, combination of changes yeah, in width and thickness uh, that is less than uh, 0.55 will give you a tongue-shaped uh, end to the, uh, the bar. And if the width change over the thickness change is larger than uh, 0.55, you tend to have these uh, uh, fish tail. Um, and, and the reason is really uh, because uh, you have uh, the free flow of the material, yes, in the in the uh, length direction. So, so um, if say uh, if you would roll this out, yes, the uh, something that's really strongly dog boned, right, where so the delta W uh, over delta H, yeah, the the thickness change is is uh, large. Yeah, to something like this, hmm? then um, you will, uh, at the end, hmm, when, when you roll this out, yes, hmm, uh, because there's more material here, yes, you will end up having something that looks like this, hmm? Hmm? because uh, this was just thicker. Yeah? So you'll get longer, longer edges, basically, hmm? because this material is thicker. When you reduce it, it becomes longer. Okay, so that's. So this would be this, the, the, the cross section, this cross sectional view, and this would be the top view. Hmm? So you get this. All right. Okay, and, and so as a result, uh, why, why are we interested in, in, uh, in this problem? It's because uh, you cannot um, use this uh, type of end to the bars to do the fin to start the finishing, so you have to cut them off. Yes, so you'd like to you'd like to minimize this uh, problem, hmm? this uh, these fish tails or these thongs, hmm? and you, you, that's why one of the reasons why almost all the bars end up being cropped at the front and at their ends uh, to avoid uh, having to uh, deal with this type of uh, ends. Okay, so this is the vertical edger. So the, the way, uh, so that's prior to the, the actual uh, rough rolling. So you have here, you have your motor, hmm? and then via gears and a spindle, this is this long uh, rod here, hmm? um, you can, uh, it activates, it makes this uh, roll here uh, turn, yes, and uh, uh, this is shown here, what it looks like. Yeah. This is the roll, it's uh, horizontal. And uh, you have, of course, cylinders 
hydraulic cylinders that will uh, push the rolls into position and apply the necessary force. Hmm? All right. Uh, there are um, new methods to uh, change the width uh, of uh, 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 slabs, hmm? and they are um, called the, the two words for them is this slab sizing presses or flying size press. Hmm? And in this case, what you what you do is um, is the following. With these rolls, uh, the reason why you actually have uh, this problem of dog boning is because you apply you apply the deformation uh, on the roll very locally. Yes, it's very local. Um, what these uh, flying size presses do? They actually forge the entire slab. They basically apply a very large, oops, uh, you have a very wide tool, yes, that forges the, uh, the entire slab to a smaller width. And uh, so the big advantage of this, you can uh, do reductions which are considerably larger, up to about 30 centimeters, and you don't have fish tails uh, as a re uh, uh, because you, d you don't get the, the dog bone shaped, hmm? right? And of course, uh, if you have a reduction in, uh, in width, you get uh, an increase in thickness, very homogeneous in this case. Hmm? So that means that you can reduce the, the, the number of uh, different uh, sizes, cross sections of slabs. Hmm? Hmm? For instance, you can do everything of course, it depends on your, your production schedule and, and you know and, and what you're producing. But you can reduce uh, uh, the need for widths to about four to five slab widths to cover all the requirements, width requirements that you produce. Yes, um, that has productivity implication. Um, it uh, it benefits hot charging. And th the main thing is uh, no fish tails, and the the shape of your uh, your slab is, is remains very nice and, and parallel. Your surfaces are remain parallel. It is a very costly solution because it's uh, because the um, when you have a local roll that changes the width, um, it's it's not very difficult. Yes, um, when you're doing the uh, because the um, the deformation is very localized, so you can have the the slab passing in front of these rolls, right? And however, if you are um, forging your slab like this, yes, something has to stand still, yes. You can imagine the slabs moving by, and you're trying to forge it as it's moving by. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, you need to have a flying press, yes? So the, 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 the forging mechanism goes with the slab, yes? Okay, so the, and, and, and so it's, it's a much more complicated mechanism um, uh, be, because the, uh, the, the, the mechanism has to run together with the, the slab as it moves into the, uh, into the roughing mill. Hmm? Right, and uh, yeah, and so you, you uh, usually uh, means that uh, you're going to handle larger uh, slabs, uh, and and you need in general a heavier equipment uh, around the the roughing mill. That's where the investments come from. Mm -hmm. So what what it looks like. Um, is, is like this. This is the principle, right? You have small rolls before and after here that, that keep the, uh, the, the slab uh, moving. And then you have these uh, 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 tools here, yes, which are basically uh, forging tools, anvils, that will uh, reduce the width of the slab, yes? And then as it touches the slab, 
it moves with it. Hmm? So you have this uh, complicated mechanism here that uh, does the, the forge and uh, can move along with the, uh, with the slab. Hmm? So big, big advantage, flexibility in production planning because uh, of you don't need that many widths in your, in your slabs. So uh, you cannot see it very well here, but you have uh, the slab moves. You get the anvil uh, action as as it moves. Hmm? Um, okay, so see, this is the important thing: is width reduction is considerable. It's about thirty centimeters. Hmm? Okay. The uh, then the the uh, so, so you have to imagine the the. Uh, uh, you, you get your slab, gets given the right width, and then goes directly into the roughing mill. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, um, the roughing mill looks like this, <coughs> very big uh, stand, um, and it's what we call a reversible mill, usually. It means that we will pass the slab through the mill once, and then the slab will come back in the other direction, yes, and be rolled again. So one, and until you have the required uh, bar thickness. Hmm? The types of uh, mill, hmm? this is what we call a four high mill because you have two what we call backup rolls, two backup rolls, yeah? and uh, two work rolls. Yes, so to get a four, and the, the slab goes here in this direction uh, and goes back till you achieve the correct um, uh, thickness. The, um, uh, there are uh, males where you have what we call tandem uh, males. So where you do the rough rolling, you go through one, roughing mill and then another one, another one, and the slab moves through this tandem process. These uh, type of roughing mills are very rare. They exist, uh, but they're very rare because this makes the, the plant extremely long, yes? And um, so you usually don't see them. The a roughing mill, the roughing mill is usually one or two, but usually most of the time one, a big um, uh, uh, four high or two high mill stand. Hmm? Okay, um, let's see some numbers here. Uh, the diameter of the work roll, yeah, that is uh, this roll here. Mm -hmm. Typical is, goes 13, 15, 15, uh, okay, this is the backup roll. The work roll is here, right? Typically, it's of the, the diameter is uh, uh, 1,200, yes? So that means that your um, millimeters, right? Uh, that your um, uh, that you, you know these are these are big rolls, right? This is a thousand, so this is about a, a meter uh, diameter, right? And the uh, the backup rolls are slightly larger, hmm? about one and a half meters. So you're looking at very big rolls here. Hmm? The um, uh, uh, barrel length, yes, barrel length, that's the, the length of your, uh, uh, is about, in, so in, in this case, uh, typical barrel length, two, uh, two meters. So, so you're looking at uh, three, mil, three meter, uh, excuse me, um, one and a half meter, uh, and here one meter type of, uh, dimensions and uh, the, the length about two meters. So you, you know, you're looking at a uh, huge amount of um, uh, very large uh, rolls. Hmm? And the number of passes is, um, is three to seven. Hmm? Hmm? And, uh, and here you have some numbers for the edger. Hmm? Okay. So the uh, what are we trying to do in the in the roughing mill? We're basically making the transfer bar or the bar, yes, 
which will then go into the finisher. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We do thickness and width reductions. So we size the slab in the uh, uh, vertical uh, width reduction mill. And our slab reduction uh, thickness goes typically from about 20 centimeters to 25 centimeters down to uh, uh, two and a half centimeters to uh, say four centimeters, mm, which are typical uh, finishing entry thicknesses. Mm. So, so as you reduce the thickness by, by 10, again, the material becomes 10 times longer. So if it was 10 meters, it becomes 100 meters, yes. And so the typical um, reductions uh, that you do per pass mm, will be of the order of you know, a few centimeters. Mm. So uh, temperature control, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the slab will just uh, not be heated during the process. Mm. And so you'll get constant temperature loss as you uh, process the slab into a, a bar. Mm. And the idea is to, you, you have to carry out the deformation uh, at a high enough pace so that you can deliver the bar at the finishing mill at the right temperature. So, then, so, so that the finishing temperature of the uh, finisher um, is, uh, is correct. And so also you want to avoid and minimize surface defects, which may be the result of scale formation. Okay. So um, there are many designs for mills, yes. And uh, so in, uh, in the steel industry, uh, certainly when it comes to the hot strip mill, you may s basically see two high and four high mills for the roughing. Hmm? Six high mills are usually not, uh, visible, not present in uh, hot strip mills. They, you will see them in cold strip mills. And then these cluster mills here are only uh, only when you go to very uh, small thickness. Right? Okay, so, so we'll be talking about those at a later stage when, when we talk about the uh, you know, thin gauge material. Okay, so this is an example here. This is a two high uh, roughing mill and this is a four high roughing mill. So you, you, uh, you see the, uh, the big backup rolls and the, the smaller uh, work rolls here. Um, again, uh, this, every plant, there's no like uh, single rule for uh, sizes of, of, uh, of uh, work roll and backup rolls, yes? Um, the, uh, or, or the type of mills. It's basically a process of mill design, but in general, you can see, um, you, you will see that, um, uh, for instance, let's look at uh, the uh, fifth generation continuous uh, hot strip mills, which, which are very common. So you see that the roughers, yes, will be uh, four high, yes, four high mills. Um, and the, the dimensions of the, um, the rolls are pretty much the same. In, uh, and the widths, of course, depend on, on the product, uh, the type of products you, you uh, make. The, uh, these rolls, and we'll talk in uh, detail about this uh, separate uh, lecture, uh, they're, they're special types of steels, yes, uh, uh, which are very hard, of course, uh, and uh, t resistant to temperatures. But they are subject to uh, uh, very tough conditions. So you, they are very frequently replaced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, a rougher roll gets replaced after the production of 20,000 to 30,000 tons of steel mm -hmm. in, a, in a rougher uh, a work roll. And in the, the finisher, 
uh, work role, that's uh, later on, uh, every 2,500 tons. Yes? So changing roles is a very frequent occurrence yes? in a um, uh, hot strip mill. Hmm? Uh, because you know that uh, a, a coil or a slab itself already weighs 20 tons, right? So if you divide this by 20, you can see that uh, it doesn't take many slabs to uh, uh, before you uh, have to uh, replace the, the work rolls. Hmm? Okay, so uh, at this stage, um, we can either continue talking about um, the hot strip mill or we can uh, uh, stand back a little bit and uh, say things uh, about uh, the rolling process. I think it's better to uh, take a step back and, and have a look at what do we know or what should we know about the rolling process that's relevant to, uh, to our um, lectures. So, so I'm going to go through a few rolling essentials. And again, I will... Uh, this is not a course on rolling, so I will focus on what's important for us to know, yes, and put in some numbers where it's necessary. Hmm? Okay, so um, so rolling has a little bit the same as uh, forging. So let's let, let's make things simpler and look at forging first. Hmm? So if I have a piece of hot material or just a piece of steel, yeah, between two anvils and I push down here, I push down, uh, you, under, you will, I think, accept from me that here in this point here, the material yeah, doesn't move left or right. Yes? However, um, on this side and on this side, the material moves out, outward, when I do plastic. Yeah? So there is something of a velocity gradient. Yes? In the middle, material doesn't move, velocity is zero, yes? And on this side, it, it, it has a high velocity in one direction, yeah? And on this side, the material also has a, uh, the same velocity, but it goes in the other direction, yeah? Okay, that's interesting. So what happens to the anvil? If you, if you look at the material moves, when I compress it to the left on this side, yes? And, and the what happens to the surface of the anvil doesn't do anything. So you know that when you have two surfaces, solid surfaces that move across each other, you'll get friction, right? So we've got um, changes in the velocity of the material, because this material literally moves in this direction, this one moves in this direction, and then a difference in velocity between your tool and the material surface, which creates friction. In rolling, you have something similar, hmm? except we, you basically have a gradual change in the thickness, yes, as you go through the what, what's called the roll gap, yes, you go through the roll gap, and you also have this this an equivalent to this middle position here in the uh, in this forging uh, schematic you have what's called the neutral point, yes? And the neutral point, that's the point where the um, velocity, the roll runs uh, like this, right? The velocity of the um, strip surface and the velocity of the roll surface is the same. Yeah? That's it's the point or a line, if you want, in this case, in case of rolling, yes? And the material before this uh, neutral point actually moves backward yeah? and the material in front of this, ahead of this neutral point moves forward. Yeah? So, um, so what you get is uh, material slips backwards relative to the roll speed and on this side the material slips forward relative to the roll speed. So the the strip actually moves faster out of the rolls than the roll surface velocity. Hmm? Um, okay? So that's an important point 
we, we need to remember. Okay? So as a consequence, yes, we have frictional forces. Yes? And so if you look in the roll, what's called the roll bite, right? You have uh, friction in one direction hmm, in the, uh, on one side of the uh, neutral point and in the other direction in uh, the, um, uh, on the, on the right-hand side of the um, uh, neutral point. Hmm, on, on the, so if, this, if my top hand is the roll, yes, and my bottom hand is the, the strip, yes, the, uh, and I'm looking past the neutral point, the strip goes faster than the, the roll surface. So as a consequence, w I have the, the strip surface experiences a frictional force that, you know, that pulls it back. So that's, the, that's what the ar red arrow means, right? the direction. That's what, because the, Right, so we have friction acting in, uh, in opposite direction. Again, uh, if you think about the simple forging operation, it's pretty similar. Hmm? Okay. Right. Uh, it also, the, these, um, the, the slip, the, the difference in, um, in uh, or rather the, the presence of these frictional forces creates shear deformation at the surface. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, um, if, if I look at the center of the strip, I, I look at the little uh, volume element, it really gets squashed into, uh, you know, from, from this type of rectangular shape into this elongated rectangular shape. But at the surface, I get shearing effects. Mm -hmm. So if I start with the same rectangular shape, it does get compressed, but it does also get sheared. Yes, and because here, the surface, the contact surface with the roll is fast, is faster, yes, mm -hmm. than the, the strip surface, I get shearing in addition to compression. And here past the neutral point, the strip is now faster than the, uh, the roll surface, and the material gets sh sheared in the other direction. So. Um, so what does this mean? This means that the, the, the way the material gets deformed, yes, uh, is, is not homogeneous, right? And so in hot rolling, it doesn't leave it doesn't really have a very large impact on materials properties. But this also happens in cold rolling, yes? And in cold rolling, we have uh, the same process. It doesn't matter whether we are hot rolling or cold. Um, this uh, shearing can be uh, considerable, yes? And because you change the deformation, the way the, d the material gets deformed, yes? you will also change important things like texture, crystallographic texture at the surface. So always be careful if you do steel research and you get uh, cold rolls material, yes? Don't look at the surface only. Make sure you look at the cross-section of the material because the surface, you may for instance measure texture at the surface and find some very strange results, yes? which are entirely a function of the frictional conditions in the roll gap. Hmm? Of course, um, uh, the amount of uh, uh, friction that you have depends on lubrication. Yes? In hot mail, we, de we usually don't lubricate. We don't add oils or something to lubricate the material. In cold mail, we do. And lubrication, as we will see when we discuss the cold, we, lubrication becomes a very important point, uh, a very important focus of attention. Or what other funny things can happen in and can happen and do happen in uh, during rolling? Well, uh, when the um, uh, when you do the rolling, you actually have quite 
large uh, uh, stresses, hmm, forces, excuse me, are applied to the strap. Hmm, and um, so, and there are some elastic effects that occur. For instance, uh, before the, the strip enters, there is an elastic disturbance. Yeah? Uh, the, the other thing that happens, and, and, and when you come out, yes, there is also an elastic disturbance, which is called elastic recovery. As soon as the strip comes out of this, the roll, it bounces back. You know, it becomes thicker again, slightly thicker. Huh? Um, the uh, other thing is uh, uh, elastic deformation that you have is called roll flattening. Yes, the roll surface. Yes, um, we usually calculate the roll diameter from the situation uh, not of the roll not in operation. Yes. And so we have a certain roll diameter or an, an roll radius. Hmm? For instance, in this case, the, the roll uh, radius will be 500 millimeters, yes? But that's not, in practice, that's not what it is. It's actually much, much larger than this 500 because we get roll flattening, elastic roll flattening. Hmm? So the radius, the actual radius, is significant larger than the, the you know, than the physical uh, work roll radius, hmm? Hmm? right? And and uh, so uh, and uh, what we always have also is, or can have, depends on the situation, is the f forward slip is the fact that the strip moves a few percent faster than the work roll surface speed on exit. Hmm? Um, now we can um, control. What is happening within the, uh, the roll gap? Not only by changing the roll forces, obviously, and the position of the rolls, hmm? but also by controlling the strip tension. Hmm? You can uh, have forward strip tension or backward strip tension. And that has a big effect on the location of the uh, neutral point. Um, first of all, the rolling, uh, can we consider it a pure uh, so-called plain strain deformation? Yes? So that all the deformation you give in the thickness direction becomes, is translated into a longer strip. Hmm? Is there widening of the strip as you do the deformation? Hmm? That's a valid question. Hmm? So, um, and, and, you know, and people have done this, yeah? and uh, so they have looked at, you know, if I have uh, a, a, a thickness H1 on entry and a thickness H2 on exit, hmm? so I have a certain delta H thickness difference, yes? Um, uh, what happens with the width of the um, the, the strip. So if it's a purely plain strain deformation, the width should not change. Yeah? The, the, the widths change. The delta W, so the difference between W2 and W1 here, delta W, should be zero. Hmm? Then I have plain, uh, plain strain. And you can see that that is true, yes, as long as my thickness strain is small. Hmm? Hmm? So, and, and you see here that if I have very, uh, if I do a lot of deformation, deformation in one step, yes, I will get widening. Hmm? Okay? That's one of the reasons why you never do, you never take like a big slab and roll it from 25 to 5 uh, 25 centimeter to, uh, to, to 5 uh, centimeters, yes, in one go. Hmm? Because your, your, uh, that would you know, view you know, a barrel shaped uh, product, I guess. Okay. Now, um, what about the, 
the, the, the rolling uh, forces. Okay? Good. It turns out that when you roll a material, yes, the, uh, the force you apply to deform the material has two big uh, parts. Part of the, uh, the force is used to deform, do the actual deformation. Other part, important part, is related to the friction. Yes, the, the, the friction just talked about. Hmm? So, um, if you uh, look at the force that is applied on the roll, yes, you can first, you should think of it as actually being distributed along the length, this contact arc, yes, as a pressure, yes, as a pressure. And, uh, and this pressure varies with position along this arc. Yeah? And, and this is the, the way it varies. So if this is x, this is along the arc here. You'll say what the arc is curved and your x-axis is straight and you would be right. However, it turns out that this, um, the way we usually represent this for didactic reason, uh, this arc is a, a lot more curved than it is in practice. So this, uh, you know, we can pretty much, uh, for, for the present purposes, think of this arc as being the, the, uh, along the x-axis. Right? So if you look at this uh, roll uh, pressure you know, along uh, this, uh, along the roll gap here, you see that this is the, the pressure distribution. And it has a peak, yes, and this peak occurs at the neutral point, position of the neutral point, and it consists of two parts. Hmm? Hmm? If you integrate underneath here hmm? to get an idea of the, the total force, yes, you have the, this blue, this green surface first, which is the force required to deform the steel in compression. And then you have this big mountain, yes, yes, and the surface of this mountain is proportional to the force required to overcome frictional forces. Hmm? And that's, that's the right uh, representation. So there's a lot of loss of um, uh, energy basically to, to friction mm -hmm. and uh, it's clear that uh, we want to control and, and limit this friction. Mm -hmm. By the way, mm -hmm. uh, at this stage I'd like to introduce just a few formulas, yes, so uh, you get, you can um, uh, get to know or understand a few of these numbers that we'll see about rolling forces as we go. Mm -hmm. uh, the length here, the, the, the length, the contact length between the strip and the roll mm -hmm, can be approximated by this formula. Uh, the square root of r, r being the radius of this, uh, the roll, times the difference in thickness, so h, uh, h0 minus h1. So this is an important formula, yes? And the rolling load yes, is equal to, well, it's basically the, you integrate this roll pressure curve, yes, uh, that's the way you should do it, but you can also do it more easily. You say, well, I'll assume that there is, instead of this variation here, that I have a mean pressure, P mean, a mean pressure. Yeah. And if I multiply this with the width, of my roll and the length of my uh, contact area, I have um, so pressure times surface that will give me a force. Yes, and so that will give me the rolling load. Hmm? Where W again is the width of the strip, and PM is the mean pressure, and LP is the contact length. Hmm? Okay. 
the um, um, friction has an important uh, plays an important role hmm, um, in rolling and uh, one of the uh, best way to illustrate this is to look at the condition to, uh, to start the rolling. Hmm? Uh, when you look at the rolling process as I presented here, you are in a regime, yes? Hmm? You, you basically, uh, but um, when you start rolling, you basically start with an open gap and what is the size or the, uh, the opening of the gap that you should have to start the rolling, yes? Um, it may be a silly thing, but um, let's, let me give you an example. Uh, right, so this is the, uh, the so-called uh, angle of bite, yes? Mm -hmm. um, so this means, for instance, that Uh, say I have something like this, right? Will this work? Will you be able to start rolling? No, right? You, yeah. um, so you, obviously you feel that, uh, well, this should be small. It should be something like this, perhaps, a much smaller alpha angle, yeah? yeah. But where does it start? What, how, how small is alpha, yes? Uh, is it? Is it? Will it? Will it? Uh, will you be able to start rolling when it's this situation, or when it's this situation, right? It's anybody's guess. The obvious thing is that in this case, it's just you know you have a huge slab. It, it's not going to work, right? You're not going to be able to engage. So you need a small. Uh, now. So so, well, it turns out that the condition for engagement is just given by this this simple formula. The angle, this angle of bite, yes, yeah, should be such that the tangent of this angle is equal to the friction coefficient. Yeah? So mu is the friction coefficient, alpha is the angle of bite. So obviously, um, if, um, if mu is, uh, is zero, for instance, yeah, there is no, you, you'll never you'll never be able to, to start rolling. Mm -hmm. So even in this case, yes, if there is no friction, it's not going to happen, right? So this is a situation, for instance, where we illustrate the fact that y if you have no friction, you cannot actually start the rolling. Yeah? So friction is also, to a certain extent, necessary. So in other words, it needs to be controlled. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Another point that is important, and I'm not again not deriving any of this formula, but uh, so the, the first formula that was interesting is that friction, so the the tangent of the bite angle should be equal to the friction coefficient. Another uh, uh, important formula that illustrates the impact of friction is the fact that the maximum reduction you can give yes, during rolling is also related to the friction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the maximum delta H yeah, is related to the friction. Mm -hmm. And you can see the formula here is equal to R times mu let me get this right, mu square, okay? So if you want to have large reductions, yes, you will have to have friction. Hmm? Okay, so these two formulas illustrate the impact of friction and the necessity of friction in, in rolling. Hmm? Okay? Um, right, so we have maximum reduction. Condition for the engagement, so friction is important parameter in rolling. Hmm? 
Uh, and of course, we've already seen that uh, the friction gives rise to the, this uh, mountain of force that I will need, mountain of pressure that I'll need to overcome these frictional forces. Hmm? In hot strip mill and in cold strip mill, we have very different conditions yeah, of uh, friction. Hmm? So the hot strip mill, we have a friction of 0.2. Yes, it's a fr friction coefficient value. Yeah? And so it's a rather sticky, sticky uh, friction. Hmm? So it's, a, you c it's a high friction situation, hmm? uh, in other words. In the cold strip mill, we have very low friction, yes? And we control, and the level of control of uh, the friction coefficient is uh, by lubrication, yes? And so lubrication is a very important aspect of um, uh, hot, uh, uh, cold strip rolling, which, which we will discuss, which you can see um, you have a uh, friction coefficient at about half or less. Hmm? Um, right, so, so what influences the, the friction coefficient? So f first of all, let's, let's look at the friction coefficient here, yes, friction coefficient values, and let's look at hot rolling and cold rolling. Hmm? So, the, um, so uh, here we have a ferritic stainless steel, hmm? And you can see the rolling is being done was done at different temperatures, and you can see that uh, for, for these kind of conditions, the uh, the friction can increase to about 0.5, yes, as I lower the temperature, yes. In an austenitic steel, this is a low carbon steel. Hmm? Uh, in normal uh, uh, hot strip mill conditions, again, you can see very wide uh, range of uh, friction coefficients, but they're high. Hmm? In contrast, in cold rolling, uh, this is a low carbon steel, uh, measurements made uh, in lubricated conditions, yes, the uh, friction coefficient is much smaller. Hmm? Right. Uh, so what are the parameters which influence the friction coefficients? Hmm? So uh, the strip speed and the work roll speed. Hmm? Uh, hmm? So what we usually get is that as the work roll speed increases, yes, we see a decrease in the friction coefficient. Lubrication has an effect. An increase in the amount of lubrication will reduce the friction coefficient. Hmm? Uh, also, a temperature increase will decrease the uh, coefficient of, lubri of uh, friction. Roughness has an important uh, effect on uh, friction coefficient. If you have a high work roll roughness, we'll have an increase in the friction. Hmm? And of course, because the roll surface is being subjected to all this friction, the wear will have an, the effect of reducing rough roll, rough, uh, the roughness of the roll. And, and so it's, in fact, a parameter that constantly changes. So temperature, pressure, type of steel, and scale will all influence the lubrication. So it's one of these parameters that um, big impact, but little we can do to actually control it. Hmm? Certainly in the hot strip mill, hmm? where uh, the fact that we have these very high temperatures make it virtually impossible to use lubricants, which tend to be organic products. And, and you know, as soon as they are at high temperatures, they, they, um, they are being destroyed. Hmm? All right. So uh, let's have a look at some numbers here. Yeah? Just plug in some uh, numbers in these uh, two equations we, uh, we just introduced. Hmm? So 
uh, example, for instance, of uh, the application of this formula, the maximum reduction that we can give, you see, is a function of the rate of my roll, that's something I can control, and the friction coefficient, all right? So it means that low friction coefficients will mean smaller delta H's, okay? So it's so an example one, we have a hot strip mill, and we're looking at roughing. Hmm? We're a high friction con situation, uh, you already know. So the R value, yes, we assume that we have a 1.2 uh, meter uh, diameter roll, so that's 600 millimeter uh, radius, a friction coefficient of 0.2, which in a delta H max is 24 millimeters. So we can give reductions which be of that order, yes? Another example, hot strip mail in the finisher now, high friction, there are rolls typically smaller diameters smaller diameters, 300 millimeters. Hmm? So not uh, one meter, but six to 700 uh, uh, millimeters, okay? Friction 0.2, how much reduction can we give? Will be limited to about 12 uh, millimeters. Gold strip mill, low friction, radius is uh, slightly smaller, similar but slightly smaller than the finishing mill. It has, our friction coefficient is about 0 0.0, uh, 0.1, 0.1, excuse me, 0.1. So a, a good value is 0 0.08. Plug it in the formula, 1.6. So very big differences. So, so as a consequence, yes, you will, um, in the hot strip mill, you will have 14 passes Total, you'll, you'll roll, the, uh, the, the slab will go through 14 deformations and you will go from 25 centimeters to 5 or thereabouts uh, millimeters, right? So that's a considerable amount of uh, decrease. So, and the decrease is about, you know, if I just uh, make an average here, 17 millimeters per pass. In my cold strip mill, I typically g will go from this six millimeters to something around one millimeter. It can be less than one millimeter, it can be, for instance, 0 0.7 millimeter, that's not. So, you, and you do this in seven passes. How, what's, you remove less than a millimeter thickness per pass as a consequence, yes? All right? So very big differences. Um, uh, fundamentals uh, of uh, rolling, determined by fundamental aspects of uh, rolling. Hmm? Okay, so, uh, so in rolling, and in general, we, we always have as a working assumption that we have plain strain and the strain is homogeneous. Yeah? So we, uh, we very often ignore the, the shearing at the surface um, of the, the strip, we have a constant work roll diameter, yes? Mm -hmm. And so the, deform the material will have a deformation resistance, yes? Okay? Which will determine how much force we need to apply. Mm -hmm. And this deformation resistance is depending on composition, uh, microstructure, temperature, and of course the rate at which we do the deformation. Hmm? Uh, the other important parameter that we saw is the friction coefficient, hmm? and then whether or not we have back stresses or front tension in the strip. Hmm? So what I'll do now, uh, well I'll introduce them, I won't be able to discuss them in, in great detail, but I'll introduce them for the next lecture. So what uh, you'll show, well, I'll show is the, uh, the pressure in the roll gap. That's Px, yes? This Px. Huh? And uh, so that's usually what people are interested in hmm? when, when they look at uh, rolling or they do calculations about rolling. And we divide this, yes, by 
2 divided by square root of 3 times sigma, and sigma being the deformation resistance of the steel. Yes? And when you do this, the graph that you get is independent of material's properties. Yes? And then you, you only have to, uh, you, only, you can easily see what will be the effect of my friction coefficient and what will be the effect of my radius and what will be the effect of back tension and forward tension. Okay? That's a useful way of uh, presenting um, uh, the uh, rolling uh, uh, pressure in the roll gap. Hmm? So again, let's have a look. This is my roll, uh, my two work rolls. I have here uh, my strip moving from left to right. I have a neutral point. Yeah? I can look at the uh, uh, the, 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 the deformation, the, the pressure, as it were, hmm? that's, that's P if you want, or sigma Y, that will have a maximum around the neutral point. It's also important to realize that there, is a shear, that there are shear forces, as I explained, yes? and, and that on, uh, they go into one direction in, uh, before the neutral point is reached, and then they go suddenly into another direction as the neutral point is passed. So you get uh, the shear forces look like this. Okay. Um, that being said, so if we look now at this, um, uh, the force, excuse me, the pressure in the roll gap as a function of the, the position in the arc length or the x uh, direction, as I said earlier. Um, so what is the effect of the friction? Well, it doesn't surprise us. The friction hell decreases. So this is the effect of decreasing friction. Hmm? What happens if I change the radius of the, the roll? Hmm? So this is for a large roll, yes, and this is for a smaller roll. Hmm? Well, again here, I reduce the friction hell. Yes? And, 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 and in general, the mean pressure uh, within the roll gap. Um, same thing, of course, I, I can in, uh, decrease the R over H value. It uh, gives me something similar. Hmm? So the, the, the effective uh, ratio of roll radius of exit, yeah? and, and the effective ratio of roll radius to exit thickness. Yeah? So, um, so basically meaning that uh, either if you reduce the, the roll size of, or you uh, do less reduction, this uh, hill, this <coughs> friction hill will uh, decrease. And then what is very interesting is tension. Hmm? Uh, if you apply, for instance, back tension on your strip, I get a reduction of, the, uh, of this friction hill. Yes? Mm -hmm. So this is, for instance, uh, the effect of the pass reduction. Mm -hmm. This is the same basically as this here, mm -hmm. R being constant and H decreasing. Excuse me, this is the exit uh, thickness, so increasing. So uh, you see that as you give less reduction, obviously you reduce your um, pressure in the roll gap. Okay, I'll come back to that next, next lecture. Um, and um, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, see you um, in a few days. <laughs>